Hello, World IA Day friends. I'm Sarah Mayer, and with me is Cynthia Klosky. Hello. We're both partners at the brand agency, Shift Collaborative. And at Shift, we tackle all sorts of communication challenges that brands face when trying to grow, when trying to gain more attention, and when trying to reach their vision. We really love World IA Day. Every year, we encourage as many people on our team to attend as possible. Some years, we've sent everybody uh, who's working with Shift. Um, we get so much out of, um, out of this, no matter what our roles are in the organization. So while it's easy to see how, for example, information architecture applies to say website design, um, what we find is that the methods and the uh, topics, uh, as well as sort of the overall philosophies and approach really apply to all the work that we do. So we find that everyone gets a lot out of uh, all the things that we do when we come to this, when we come to this event. This year's theme of curiosity is one that's really close to our hearts. Curiosity, um, this, the, the desire to know, the desire to learn new things is um, actually sort of a characteristic of everyone who works at Shift. And of course, it's really a precursor to doing the kind of work that we do to, uh, first of all, understand a challenge or a problem, and then to discover new and interesting ways to solve that or to, to really, under, um, really create new solutions. So it's part of what we do. And we think it's a great theme for this, for this event for, for the year. If you're curious about Shift, we're always looking to expand our network of collaborators. We are around in all the usual web places, so stop by and say hello. And hey, we hope you have a wonderful day here at World IA Day of curiosity, learning, and exploring. We want to say thank you to all of the folks involved in planning this wonderful day, and we are proud to be sponsors of this event. As an information architect who loves to make sense of messes, I have developed a lifetime curiosity about what it takes to make more sense. What are the skills that allow us to make sense of the world around us? When do we learn these skills and are we born as sense makers? What parts of sense making might we purposely strengthen over time? And is there an age when we're set in our sense making ways? Are we ever too old to change how much sense we make? Who wants to make more sense? We all do, right? Making more sense means that others can understand us and being understood, well, that's most often our goal. Sense-making is how we decide what things mean to us. That sounds simple, right? But don't be fooled by the simplicity. In truth, sense-making is so often harder than we allow it to seem, which leaves too many of us paralyzed by a should storm. I should be able to make sense of this. This should make sense to them things should make more sense by now. In observing my two-year-old son making sense of the world, I've been reminded that the frustration brought on by the swirl of the should storm comes long before the making sense part is even possible. One of his current favorite daily games is to unpack all of my meticulously arranged markers, pens, and pencils to create his own simple taxonomies, or as he calls them, piles. Sometimes they're by color, but not always. The other day it was caps versus no caps. After some time on the problem, he proudly observed that crayons, no caps. I curiously observe him and I wonder how he's making sense of the world through sorting in ways that he feels noticeably compelled and confident about now, when weeks ago, all there was was wild hand movements and lots of throwing. Seemingly no sense at all, just sporadic landings, less piles, more scatters, but now, now his piles have careful placements, arrangements. Even most recently, he's added verbal labels. These are crayons. These are markers. These are pens. These are mama's markers. These are Jamie's crayons. These are red. These are green. He's making metadata models in his head. He's finding new and different facets about the things that he already understands. He's going deeper. He's making more sense. But before those metadata-rich taxonomies that are now as obvious to him as the daylight was the frustration of not being able to make sense of those same things, to look at them instead with a million simultaneous questions about what they are and what to do with them and what you are and how the world is and what it is to even be at all. How could you possibly focus on making piles? We can't find places for things until their meaning is clear. Now I've watched him progress from letting fate drive his arrangements through throwing to making messy piles based on his momentary understanding 
to multifaceted labeling and categorization. And once the hindsight kicked in, I understood each iteration that he went through on his journey from the chaos of not knowing to the confidence of knowing. Now, I must admit, watching him develop these basic sense-making skills whilst destroying the calm of my marker taxonomies was equal parts joy and frustration for me. For the first few days after he developed this love of unpacking all my craft supplies, I would carefully resort and arrange all of the markers, pens, and pencils at the end of each day after his bedtime. Y'all, this was a nightmare. I became so frustrated every time his joy-filled face said markers, knowing where he was headed and how much time it would suck for me later that evening. I thought really hard about my frustration, and rather than dig in, I thought instead about sense-making. I thought about how I was quick to assign blame to Jamie being messy in my fog of frustration. And when I committed to make more sense, I identified that it was my self-imposed pressure to maintain the markers in their proper, correct arrangements as being the primary source of my frustration, not my child, who is just trying to take on the sense-making journey of a multi-generational obsession with stationary supplies. After much consideration, I decided that the minor uptick in findability and aesthetics that sorted markers provided was actually not worth the frustration brought on by my child's unbridled joy for marker messes. Finally, I realized that if I didn't actually care about the order that the markers were put away in, he would do it for me and even enjoy it if I made it part of the game. Putting things into things is his second favorite hobby, right after taking things out of things. So now we live with unorganized markers, but without the frustration of watching him ruin my arrangements because he wants to make sense of them a different way than I do. And I'm glad that I adapted, but more so, I am glad that it made me curious about what happens when you aren't a two-year-old and the frustration sets in. When your real life doesn't line up with common sense, how do you make more sense? What is the set of skills that makes some people frustratingly unable to make sense and others to bravely make all the sense that's needed? Our sense-making must come to work extra hard on days where we have to weather a should storm. And sense-making is what we rely on when common sense is no longer enough or working as prescribed. Common sense is, after all, so often wrapped up in its own should storm. With sense-making applied, these markers should be neatly arranged because, I don't know, that's pleasing to look at, becomes we could put away the markers sloppy and quickly together since we know we're going to be back here to do this thing all over again tomorrow which makes way more sense if what we're doing is optimizing for joy over all things, which lucky for me and my life, we are. Now, I don't think that sense-making is just of interest to those of us raising humans or to the information architects out there. I think sense-making is an undervalued, underutilized, undercultivated skill set that most people and organizations would benefit greatly from. Sense-making is the skill set that I think is wildly applicable to pretty much any role where you're serving other people. And after more than a decade of people telling me that sense-making is my superpower and writing a book that boldly claims to know how to make sense of any mess, I decided to get curious and take a deeper look at my own experience learning to make more sense and the lessons that I learned along the way that I think made me the sense-maker that I am today. So I want to tell you three stories from my own career and then leave you with a framework of six skills that I think are essential to making more sense. Our first story is set in 2007 in Chicago, in a small healthcare agency where I am their IA team of one. My job is introducing information architecture to a group of people that have spent their entire career in healthcare marketing doing award-winning work without an IA ever being involved. To say that there was an adjustment period would be an understatement. I found myself in almost daily disagreements with many of my coworkers, who were often just defending the status quo of the healthcare industry, which was known for being immovable and overbearing. And that's what you would say if you were being kind. So at this point in the story, I am 25 years old, and I have been practicing information architecture professionally for a few years. And I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the process to take on to support a variety of methodologies. I know a lot about the tools that we could use and the ways in which deliverables are ideally executed and distributed. I even know how to run a meeting with other adults where I don't feel like puking and everyone thinks that we get something done. 
But here's the thing. At this point in the story, I really only had like half of the equation. I knew how to make a place that had content in it that made sense to me. And I even knew how to make a place that had content in it that made sense to users. What I failed to understand for several more years is that that is only halfway there. Let me give you an example. Okay, one day I was called into a meeting with a PM for a project that I had shipped quite a number of weeks prior. I was already busy with new work and I was annoyed that this meeting was even occurring. They came into the room also obviously annoyed to be discussing this last minute request by the client, but it was a simple change. It was one that would take me less than five minutes, but it needed to be done immediately. And getting it done was a linchpin to this whole approval process, which had a payment milestone. And that was already several weeks pushed due to this other approval nightmare we could not have predicted. They wanted me to replace a simple sentence that was quite crisp and clear with something that was much more verbose and vague to quote, make the lawyers happy, they said. My blood boiled. Okay, now remember team, at this moment, this person and I are coworkers. We are on the same team. Now I remind you of that because 38 year old me is still a little shocked by what's about to occur with 25 year old me. Now I have a two-year-old, so let me describe this as I see it now. I had a meltdown straight to frustration town. I was frustrated that this was overriding my recommendations. I was frustrated that I wasn't being treated like an expert. I was frustrated that they had not fought harder for the user, somehow feeling that their lack of user centricity fell on my shoulders because I was, after all, the one tasked with bringing this new way of thinking and working to the agency. My heart hardened and I refused to make the change. In fact, I demanded a phone call with the client in which we discussed the change and its quote, impact to the user experience. <sighs> I didn't win. Honestly, I don't even know how they smoothed over the event with the client, but I was eventually called into a small conference room. They called it the womb because it was used for those kinds of chats. My manager spoke as if trying to avoid a snake attack, but they were brave and clear. I would make the change immediately. And the next day, we would sit down and talk about this incident, which they described as a pattern. I made the change and sent it back to the PM, and then I packed up and headed home to fret about probably getting fired the next day. But I didn't get fired. Instead, I found a manager wanting to help me pass the frustration to the making sense part. They told me that while my IA work was impeccable, I lacked some of the critical skills needed to work with other people. Then they proposed that I go to a seminar called Working Better with Others. <sighs> After getting over my ego and realizing that it is 2007 and I have a job in a failing economy, I packed up for a few days and I headed to the seminar. On the first day, I came into a hushed room, everyone avoiding eye contact. I mean, just take a moment to think about the cast of characters at a seminar called Working Better with Others. I sat down at the table with the easiest plop, and in the center of the table was a prompt for us to write. It was something like, why are you here? Which in context very much felt like, so what are you in for? I wrote down briefly why I was there, that my coworkers thought I was hard to collaborate with. They say that I'm aggressive and too demanding. The moderator told us that before we started as a full class, they wanted us to introduce ourselves to the group and share our answers to the question. I went first. I've always been the brave one or the pushy one, depending on how you look at it. When I finished introducing myself, one of the people at my table said, wow, I can't even imagine you being demanding or aggressive. I turned to shoot daggers from my eyes and I said, that just shows that you don't know me very well. Also, do be careful with books and covers. It was a great first impression, huh? I didn't learn all I needed to bridge this now obvious gap in those two days in the Chicago suburbs. But what I did learn probably culminated in a phone call that I made to my mom from the parking lot at the end of day one. Picture me ugly crying while pleading, why didn't anyone tell me that I am such an asshole? Her response was something like, you would not have listened if we had. And she was right. This was the beginning of a long journey to learn that no amount of tools or processes or methods was going to strengthen my heart enough to really make sense with other people. In order to make more sense, you have to be authentic as you facilitate others towards a result. And what I used to call facilitation back then was not so. It was more like design theater where I was the director and I knew the acts which I would unveil over time to the audience cast and crew. I was afraid to bring my full heart to moments back then. My ego was too much in the driver's seat telling me that experts always know the answer. But I've learned since that experts don't always know the answer. 
True expertise is in being brave enough to proceed to find a way when one is not yet clear. True expertise is being able to say, I don't know, but I have some ideas on how to find out. If my sense-making had been stronger back then, I would have been able to see the request that they brought to me as a compromise that didn't actually have a major impact on our intentions together, which were way more nuanced than the good user experience of that single sentence. I would have been able to move through the frustration part into the making sense part to see that this was not a call out on my lack of expertise or another battle lost. This was an adjustment that was needed for the wholeness of our intention to stay in balance. Me refusing to make the change in favor of upholding the user experience of that single sentence wasn't me being authentic. It was me being threatened and scared. Now, I don't tell you this story because everyone has the same problem to work through. Not everyone is a baby asshole that would have acted like 25-year-old me in the story. I tell you this story because I think too many people never learn how to deal with the feeling part of sense-making, which isn't all roses and understanding. We can all get stuck in the should storm. They should just listen to me. I'm an expert. They should care about the user more. I should be able to make them care about the user more. But here's the truth as I've learned it. My list of shoulds is often really just a list of fears. And when I'm authentic about that and the should storm rolls in, I can work through the frustration part to get to the making sense part. Sense-making work is more than a knowledge of theory and methods. Much of the work I've found is actually on ourselves and admitting to what we do not know and cannot change. The next story I wanna share fast forwards a few years. I've recently moved to New York City to pursue independent consulting. And one of my first projects was working with a team redesigning the information architecture of the IHOP menu system. Now I had started my undergraduate degree planning to work in print design. So this was a departure from my current digital centric work, but it was a really interesting intersection with a skill set from my days past. I was curious if the same IA process would apply to physical menus that did to digital ones. So we set out to redesign the menu using a simple process that we developed for the team to go through. We ate a lot of pancakes, we watched a lot of people order and eat pancakes, and we talked to a lot of people about eating, ordering, and selling pancakes. We learned that the brand had shortened their name to IHOP, which had been a popular acronym for the International House of Pancakes. But since the name change, they had suffered a bit of a loss of identity. They'd also grown the menu to this untenable length and added way too many non-breakfast items that were really just clouding the customer's understanding of what IHOP really stood for. Now, at this time, they were also officially waging a war on breakfast against other up-and-comers in the fast food and casual dining space, who were finally catching on to this breakfast all-day trend. And as a special last straw to break their taxonomy, new regulations had been added to require that restaurants of a certain scale disclose their nutrition information on their menus. But adding this information to an already crowded 16-page glossy syrup sticky pile was overwhelming to say the least. They needed to get to agreement across the organization on the items to remove from the menu. Then they needed to redesign the menu with these new requirements in mind. We got to work and in research, we identified a few major flaws to be fixed. Now at this moment in time, new customers were asking the waitstaff pretty often what to order at IHOP, which seems silly in a place that was known for pancakes. But as we watch people use the menu and decide what to have, we notice something very important. There were pancakes on every page. Yet because of that, there was also nowhere to see all the pancakes. In an effort to up the pancakiness of the menu, they had made pancakes unfindable as a quest. So the first order of business was to put the pancakes with the pancakes, a classic taxonomy move. The next flaw we identified was in understanding of the ordering process. Now in the breakfast space, customers were used to a more diner style ordering where everything is ordered as a full meal with all of the sides included. But IHOP used this a la carte style ordering, but confusingly pictured items in a full meal setting throughout the menu, which was nothing more than an asterisk to tell customers that the sides were not included as pictured. Now this led to many complaints from customers who ordered pancakes thinking that it came with eggs, toast, and bacon, only to have a very sad, lonely pancake plate delivered at mealtime. In the new menu, we knew that we needed to make the a la carte ordering style much more apparent. With these insights in hand, we worked with the client to then eliminate off the menu items that weren't deemed to be selling well enough to deserve the ad space, and we were able to reduce from 16 pages to a more manageable 12. Then we developed regional strategies for meeting the needs of varied geographies and languages across the franchisee network. And our plans paid off. 
It was even lauded by the press as having a notable 3% increase in the sales in the stores that tested our new menu. All in all, it was a hugely successful project, which makes it a really fun story to tell. So did I tell you this story to brag? Kind of, but no. This story, and my reason for telling this story today, isn't about the results that we achieved in 2012. To get to today's lesson, I had to wait eight long years. Fast forward to summer of 2020. We are living in unprecedented times, and I am finally getting around to writing case studies about my past projects. I'm working on one about IHOP. I decide to link to some of the press articles about the success of the project, Natch, and I suppose that my Googling the words IHOP and menu redesign got the algorithms all excited, because days later, I received an eager message from Google that they had an article for me to read about the IHOP menu redesign. Friends, I want to stop the story here and just say I had literally no clue what was about to happen. I was very much expecting that this was perhaps another article bragging about my work from 2012. That is how unprepared I was here. Anyways, okay, back to the moment right before. So I open this article and I find a shocking case study about how IHOP's menu has been redesigned in 2020 in the face of COVID-19. It was reduced to a double-sided sheet of paper that could be printed in store and thrown away after each use. There was a single sentence that applied to the work that I had spent months of my life working on. IHOP is ditching its 12-page behemoth for a much cleaner two-page menu. By the way, if you click on the link on the words 12-page behemoth, you get another article where it's referred to as a 12-page laminated monstrosity. <sighs> I hope that you're starting to sense the turn in this lesson, friends. We are not here to congratulate me on my hard work from 2012. We are instead here to see that things that were made eight years ago can create obstacles for a team to overcome in today's context, regardless of the results achieved eight years ago. This was a not so long ago reminder of the reality of doing this type of work. Good sense makers are building structures that others will build upon or decide to burn down when they no longer serve them. This doesn't diminish the work of the sense makers of the past. Now, I want you to think about this in context of the organization that you work in. I guarantee you there is legacy there. There are things that you yourself are creating today that some hot shot kid may describe as a behemoth to slay eight years from today. And just as that is the case, it is also the case that there are things that you yourself are working on today that are replacing the work of sense makers in the past. This moment was a lesson for me because it was the most obvious and loud example of me having existed on both sides of this story. In 2012, 12 pages was a miracle of facilitation and change management. In 2020, that same 12 pages was a behemoth for a team under different circumstances to slay. I could not have gotten them to that one page menu. It was too great a leap for them to make at that point. I could not have gotten them to a disposable menu. How would I have looked selling that idea in 2012 where environmentalism was on the rise and disposable everything was in question? We are doing work, not magic. And work, it's never done. So I added the link to this new article to my website case study as a reminder and a lesson to all who end up there that nothing that we make is forever. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. The first time through this story, the me of 2012 learned a lot of confidence about being able to apply her brand of IA process to a complex thing that existed in physical and not just digital space. It was groundbreaking work that I needed to do outside of digital IA to propel my teaching and my thinking, and for that I will always be grateful. And of course the client was thrilled with the results. The second time through this story, the me of 2020 was dealing with the grief of my expertise and hard work being erased by the expertise and hard work of others. I learned a lot about letting go. I was reminded that while we must always prepare to adjust when doing sense-making work, the adjustments don't always stop when we are done. Now, I've heard for years people saying things like, "Ugh, I can't show that anymore. It's so old and they already replaced it anyways. And that just makes me so concerned about the value that we're missing by only looking at the most recent endpoints. There's value in the process of getting there. We are all on our own paths and the things, the organizations, the businesses that we work on, they are also on their own paths. Many sense makers may have come before on that same path, or perhaps you are blazing it yourself. Either way, others may follow and build there someday. And if you're lucky enough to be around and notified by person or algorithm when they do, 
I hope you won't miss the beauty of seeing how they can actually stand taller because of your having shouldered it before them. Also, the next time that you're describing the problems inherent in an old system that no one's touched in a while, think about that aging sense maker, maybe just a bit ahead of you in years, reading your judgments. I have learned that when walking down the paths already trodden by others, if I turn to understanding the because reasons of it all, I can usually get further. When we seek to understand instead of just name calling, we're much more likely to build on what's already good about what's there. And when we aren't curious about past sense makers, we can make missteps that they could have warned us of. The third story I wanna share is about the first project that was bigger than any example I had to follow as an IA about what to do first, next, and last. It was also the first time when the path from not knowing to knowing was anything but clear for me at the start. And it became the first time that I had to turn to the power of process in order to proceed through the hardest parts of sense-making work, uncertainty and ambiguity. Now, when you're a map maker, there is often no map to start from, or even worse, there's lots of maps and they don't make sense together. And where there's no map or many maps in need of reconciliation, there is also often a collective anxiety and quietly building pressure to make a map that everyone can agree on so we can just get to work on whatever it is we're here to do together. I've learned time after time that you can take smart people who have a ton of experience doing what they do, put them together, and not have the result of the, the group make any sense at all. They need a map of where they're headed, or the uncertainty and ambiguity will get in the way of making sense every time. Now, contrary to what I think many believe, to be successful, a team facing this kind of mapless uncertainty has to focus on the process and not the result first. The result starts with making the map, but sometimes the thing that we're after is too amorphous to proceed with the ways that we've always done things. Sometimes the thing that we need to do needs a new approach, a new method, or a different time scale than what we're used to. A few years ago, I was engaged by an agency that had been hired to help Nike to build an internal tool to replace the myriad of disconnected tools that they had cobbled together over decades as they've moved their sales process online. The promise of this digitally connected sales process was epic. All of the data would flow through one system, connecting disparate processes that had never benefited from each other's collective data wisdom before. The presentation in front of this team was breathtaking. No, literally, it would take your breath. First in excitement for the potential, but then in scope of the promise. It was hard to imagine how this work would ever get done. And like many projects, everyone was really good at what they do. The designers were ready to design, the engineers were ready to engineer, the client was ready to work towards progress. The requirements had been gathered, and yet there was something missing. They needed to get from the amorphous blob of promises made to a high-level process that could start to build momentum and understanding while the right set of frameworks emerged as the team needed them. Thanks to the experienced director on the business, Cindy Chastain, and the wonderful team at Nike who was able to go with the flow, I was given an opportunity to work through and iterate on the process day by day, week by week, and month by month as we learned more about what was needed for the team to gain clarity and focus. To be honest, at the time, it was equally a breath of fresh air and a palpable pressure for me to grow faster as a practitioner. I started by interviewing all of the people involved and getting a broader overview of the system and the process that we were trying to wrangle. It was a 96-week process that Nike used to get from the idea of a new product to that product being ordered by customers. In that first set of meetings, I learned that while there was lots of documentations about the technical parts and even the systems in place, there was no actual picture of the process that we were seeking to support with this tool. In fact, everyone had their own process that they'd been taking on in their own tool for years. The promise of combining these process into one had only been promised. And yet, at this point, no one knew what that might actually look like. Knowing how much a lack of shared map can impact a team's focus, I took that as a call to make such a map. Easier said than done. That map took me nine months and six cross-country trips to do right. We wrapped a room in Portland in craft paper and took every individual function through a collaborative mapping exercise where we plotted the steps that they would expect to individually take in the process. We did it with one roll, then cleared the walls and did it with another. And after each interview, I would go back and post it onto a digital map where I could start to lay them over one another and look for contradictions and connections. Then I worked with a subset of the Nike team members to revise and revise and revise the map until all of the contradictions were resolved and the ideal connections between people and data sources were established and documented. 
Once we had a clear map emerging, we started to look for other areas where a lack of understanding could get in the way. And we decided that language was a big one and started to work on a controlled vocabulary for the agency team and the Nike team to communicate more consistently across roles. And then we identified that the agency and other external tech partners would need a little bit more user context in order to understand the Nike roles that they were designing and building for. So we reformulated my interview findings from earlier in the process and turned them into personas that partners could reference when looking at the map. With the map, controlled vocabulary, and personas as working parts of the team culture, the designers and I got to work on what the system's interface might actually need to be like in order to support this process and the data needs that we now more fully understood. We ran a series of workshops with the potential end users at Nike, where we drew out scenarios that we picked off the map to zoom into and work on. We did a representative set of these and then used them as scenarios to create a vision storyboard that helped us to guide the client through what to expect ahead in the wireframe and interaction design review process. Once we had a broad vision, the next challenge was that we had to prioritize. The plan was to support a multi-year agile process to design, build, test, and release over time. But in order to do that, we needed to create a feature value matrix for evaluating each potential feature and piece of content, and then establish an upper ontology of tasks and content types that the tool would support after each major release cycle. We landed with a clear picture of the growth of the tool's architecture and functionality over time, mapped to the requirements that the team had gathered, supported by the map and the vision storyboard. This all allowed the team to talk about and get alignment and feedback on user needs for an interface before ever investing in designing any screen-based details. Now, I learned from this experience that process isn't always as simple as setting something up front and then doing that thing. But when the going gets tough, the process is there to keep you focused on something other than the result being so hard and far away. We need the process to stay on track, but we also need space in that process for times when we figure out that we don't really know what we need just yet. I'll be honest, this project felt a little wild at times because it was just so big and it had so much complexity and it was the most I had ever seen at that point in my career. A few months in, the project manager despondently told me that it felt like some days it was just their entire job to book plane tickets and update the Gantt chart when we uncovered another wrinkle to smooth in our map. This was the only other person who endured all six of those cross-country trips to sit in a room with me and take notes while we walk through yet another version of the process with yet another role involved. We earned our Delta medallions together that year. Working so closely with somebody who was so rightfully unsure of where all of this wildness was heading made me realize that as a sense maker, I had to be a model for this person in this moment. I had to show him how to drive through this hard part of not knowing to the better part of knowing. It was part of my role to make sure that he knew that this wasn't weird or something to be concerned about, but rather a predictable feeling of uncertainty and ambiguity that comes with any big mapping effort for the mapless. It wasn't as if I didn't have those moments of the should storm too. I did, believe me. We should be getting more done. We should have more than a messy map by now. We should know what we're building by now. The client should know more about what the process is getting them by now. But on days when such storms threaten to rain on our process parade, I found that it helped to remind myself and others that the result that we were seeking was bigger than today. It was a map of a territory so complex that no one could map it any quicker. We had the permission, we had the access, we had the information. We just needed to take the time and make the sense. I worry that people think that making sense should be immediate or, or it's no good, like nothing but love at first sense will do. You need time. Time changes us. Time changes how we think about our work. It changes the work and what we can see. There are days that I show up and wrestle with a document or a diagram for hours only to return the very next day to the same mess, but this time prepared to fix it and move on. I see too many people rushing through the sense-making process when that is the surest way to cut off your curiosity about whatever it is you're working on. We must remain curious. I wonder what this map will look like when we're done, not this is the template we're filling out. We must trust the process to lead us to the next right thing to do to figure out the next right thing to know. I find so much hope in that idea that we don't need to come prepared with all of the answers and that expertise really isn't about having all of the answers. It's about being brave enough to lead others towards finding answers. 
When I was finding answers with the Nike team, we tried some really fun things. I had a series of workshops in Portland where we rolled out our controlled vocabulary, and I wore a gym whistle around my neck to blow on anytime someone used a now banned word. I'm not sure that I would or could ever do this again, but I appreciated that they let me play and experiment with what might make the most sense in the moment to meet the team where they are. The result of my work on that project was just momentum. It feels weird to claim momentum as a result, especially when I put in almost a full year of my time. But alas, I did not design the final taxonomy or the final interface of the actual tool that was eventually designed. I've never even seen it. My entire value was in unlocking the understanding between the two teams so that they could design and build the best tool for them. They kicked off a three-year agile-based sprint cycle after our engagement, working with internal tools on a phase testing and rollout plan. On day one of my time with that team, they used different role-based language, had different views of the goal, and a lack of understanding of where they were headed together. When I left, they spoke the same language, had a crystal clear vision, and they had a map of the territory that they were building together and phase plans to build a foundation and add to it incrementally. That's the power of sense making. I believe that this is more than a story about effective information architecture. In fact, I believe that I could have done all of the same information architecture steps in this story, made maps, written vocabularies, defined upper ontologies and had very different results had I not been as strong a sense maker. 25 year old me would not have lasted an hour on this project, not because her IA skills were not sharp enough, but because the need to make more sense than what she was ready for back then was palpable and yet incredibly hard to put into words. I told you these three stories because they are all times in my career where I learned what it takes to make more sense. And after looking at my own journey to becoming a sense maker, I became curious if other people could better identify and strengthen sense making skills in themselves and others, if only there was a curriculum to start from. When I was 25, I had my head in the right place and my hands doing the right things, but my heart had not yet been strengthened to the reality of what sense making work takes. I lack knowledge of this weakness, but even more, I lack resources telling me how important these skills were to the work that I had chosen to spend my life working on. And I am lucky to have had a manager who could skillfully call this out and recommend a tangible method of helping. But this is unfortunately the part of my story that is not a common one. Many people jump from job to job with no one ever helping them to really understand the friction that they feel with others or within themselves. I became curious if this lack of wholeness when developing sense-making skills is in fact common. And if it is, might I help people like 25-year-old me not make so many embarrassing missteps early on? Ever the information architect, I felt compelled to pick labels for the sense-making skills that I saw myself having to spend time on strengthening as my work grew in complexity. Labeling things makes them teachable, so I started working on a taxonomy of sense-making skills. As I got into it, I started to think about ways to arrange these skills, and I was reminded of my story from Chicago. When I look back on that story and countless others where I'm working on myself as part of my IA work, I think most about working on my heart. Using the heart as a metaphor made me curious about what other metaphorical parts of ourself are strong or weak as a sense maker. I identified three areas of myself, head, heart, and hands, and started to sort each sense maker skill that I had identified to the part of myself that each skill felt most strengthened by. I designated the thinking to the head, the feeling to the heart, and the making to the hands. This felt like a dumb model at the time, but honestly, after months of playing with it, I have kind of fallen for it. While the reality of these actual body parts is that they are all inextricably linked to all of these skills, I think that there is a beauty in the compartmentalization for the purpose of examining and strengthening. I've been thinking about it kind of like when it's leg day at the gym. That doesn't mean that your arms don't also show up and get in on the workout. It just means that your focus that day is on exercises that work extra hard on your legs. I learned so much from my own imbalance through this exercise that I became curious how a framework of these types of skills arranged this way might enable other people to better identify their own weaknesses and focus on seeking wholeness and balance as they grow in their careers instead of hyper-focusing on their strengths which I now realize 25-year-old me was doing a lot of. When I was 25, my mental model was that my head was in charge of all of the things. It was as if I was practicing IA as a head in a jar. Perhaps this is one of the many reasons that my early coworkers assigned me the nickname Abby Normal. 
And since I was a kid, writing and drawing have always been my go-to for getting things out of my overactive brain. So I found that my hands were always an easy skill set to keep track of as I grew in my career too. The part that took me much longer to identify weakness in is the part that I think of now as the missing piece to the wholeness that I have worked to strengthen and bring into balance with what came naturally to me. Now this metaphor about parts of my sense-making self helped me to understand that there are some things that I can't think and make my way out of. There are always going to be some feelings, mine and others. And I'm going to have to deal with those feelings, not just pity myself forever for having befallen human beings. I needed to develop this deep weakness of mine into a strength if I ever wanted to make more sense in an ever complexifying world. And more than a decade of introspection and therapy later, I can say I have made some progress. I now understand that getting stuck in our heads and acting out our thoughts with our hands only gets us so far. If we want to make more sense, we have to use the feeling parts of us too. If feeling was the missing piece for me, I became curious if there might be people with weaknesses where I draw natural strength in the thinking and the making. Maybe there are people who are feeling and making their way through their sense-making work without thinking too much about it. And other people who are feeling and thinking while never making much at all. Maybe some people are just thinking all the time or feeling all the time or just making all the time. Actually, now that I laid it all out, I'm pretty sure that I just described every fellow 20-something that I ever encountered at a meetup around the same time in my own life. Heck, I think I might have just described every person who feels like they don't make enough sense. After spending time on making sense of this for myself, I've become so curious if teaching this kind of wholeness is the intention that I should pursue next with my time. It feels like such a thing could be useful to the world where so little sense seems to be made most days. And so we've reached our final chapter together today, where I introduce you to my new framework of six sense-making skills. I believe that if you want to make more sense, this is a good list of skills to understand your strength or weakness in. None of these skills is easy to teach or to learn, and I consider that a feature, not a bug. I don't provide this in an attempt to make some end-all be-all model to apply to everyone, nor as a teachable model for others, just yet. And yes, you may read that as foreshadowing. I offer this model as a call to action for every sense maker to think about what it takes to make more sense in your own context and to ask yourself deeply how whole you feel in the ways that you yourself are practicing. With the time that I have left with you today, I want to introduce you to these six skills that I'm working on strengthening within myself as I search for ways to teach these skills to other people. I want to start with the heart as that is where my story of finding my own imbalance led me. There are two skills that I've identified that I think need to be strengthened to have the heart of a sense maker, being intentional and facilitating authentically. Now being intentional is above all other things, the sense making skill that allows us to do hard things in spite of and because they are hard. Being intentional involves actually knowing your intention and then being like that. It takes putting enough space between your feelings and the actions you ultimately decide to take that you stay true to your intention. When you're making something, you can never serve all people, all goals, all outcomes. We must decide. Stating an intention is the act of deciding, but being intentional is living out that decision even when it disappoints or upsets other people. And that is much more often the hard part. When I wrote a book about information architecture at a sixth grade reading level with no complex technical examples, it was in an effort to meet my intention of writing a beginner's guide to IA. If you read my lower star reviews on Amazon, you'll see that that really ticked off some people who think that I should have written that book for them. But if you read my high star reviews, you will see how that same choice helped many more than it ticked off. The part that the heart weak among us can struggle with the most is that we cannot make all people happy. And even harder is that some pursue making all people happy as their intention, only to learn a very painful lesson about how little we really control. When doing hard things, we have to decide the way that we are going because reasons, and then we have to go that way until that way no longer serves our intention or our intention changes. Once the decision is made, we must continue to be intentional, not waffle on our decided direction because we don't know what to do with other people's disappointment. 
Like many things, it is easy to set a goal and much harder to make the thousands of tiny decisions and actions to reach it. Being intentional is a skill that takes bravery to strengthen. It's not fun to get bad reviews or to hear that you didn't help somebody with something that you made. But if you spend time on the skill of being intentional, it's easier to catalog that feedback into the right place for it to be dealt with or maybe just sent to the incinerator of not my user, not my job. While being intentional is largely impactful within yourself, the second skill of the sense maker's heart is one that we turn to when collaborating with or serving other people. So let's talk about what it means to facilitate authentically. What happens when you slam two buzzwords from two different industries together? I suppose we're on a journey to find out here today. I have wrestled with these words, friends. I know that some of you are already checking out from what I am saying because of my choice to go down this mindfulness path or because you are rightfully sick of everyone telling you to work on your facilitation and authenticity without giving you much more than those buzzwords to go off of. But I've turned it around so many times and I've relabeled it for your comfort and mine even more times. And here is where I'm landing. I want to be intentionally woo woo. And here's why. These are the right words because they are so wrapped up in nonsense at the moment that they are losing the sense-making power that I believe they might uniquely hold. What if instead of rejecting these two words as being overused, misused, watered down, and yes, woo woo, we take them and we teach them as a skill that a whole generation of sense makers may use to turn that nonsense pile into arrangements that can make a whole lot of sense. I've spent a lot of time in a lot of workshops, watched a lot of people run a lot of meetings, and I've run a lot of workshops and a lot of meetings where the agenda was not about authentic facilitation. It was more about getting out unscathed and with a predictable outcome, like I could write the script of what would happen and pull strings like a puppet master. People don't work like that. Life doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, when it comes to facilitation, too many people are taught about the gimmicks like time boxes and parking lots, but they're never taught to facilitate a conversation where they're more listening than leading. They're never taught how to deal with their feelings or their part in the feelings of others. When it comes to authenticity, most people are left out in the cold education-wise. So many of us stumble through our own realizations about ourselves and our own weaknesses of the heart through our own experienced missteps. Now, I know that this is the way that we've always done it, but as a mom now and as a teacher always, I wish we could give people a little bit more of a heads up. Heck, I wish that my list of people that I personally know who could benefit from this lesson was in their mid-20s like I was in my Chicago story. But no, many of the people I encounter who need to work on this very skill the most are well into their life stories. Some of them even hold high positions. People who lack authenticity can rise quite high into the ranks without any knowledge of their weak hearts. And I have spent good time with bad models enough to know how lonely and sad rejecting authenticity really is. People who can't facilitate authentically live in the should storm, where they should be respected for their expertise. Their frustration drives their actions and it clouds their thoughts. As I mentioned before, when you really look at all of those shoulds, you often really just have a lot of fear. People who aren't able to facilitate authentically are often really just afraid of any outcome that isn't theirs to control or to claim. People who are able to facilitate authentically are able to get to the truth of the matter and make progress with those involved, regardless of the feelings that might arise in themselves or those that they're facilitating. Next, I wanna talk about two sense-making skills that I believe to be strengthened by the head of a sense-maker. And I go to these next because I think that they have a lovely duality in context to the skills of the heart. While we're being intentional, we must always also be adapting to change. This might feel counterintuitive because the concept of setting an intention and sticking to it doesn't much leave room for the idea of adapting to change at all. But this is unfortunate because in my experience, it is actually our malleability in moments of disharmony with our intention that is critical to develop. Our head's malleability supports our heart's ability to be intentional by allowing things to change without disruption, just for discomfort's sake. Adapting to change is a skill that one must apply within oneself. 
but it's also the job of a sense maker to help others adapt to change as part of the thing that you're making together. Part of being a good sense maker is thinking through and anticipating the changes that you might need to implement over time in an attempt to limit the discomfort felt by the team when eventually changes needed to happen, which let's be honest, they always do. One of the reasons that the IHUB menu architecture that I worked on lasted as long as it did was that it was very adaptable to change. We were able to discuss the nuts and bolts of the business upfront and anticipate a lot of needs. The graphic design of the menu changed many times seasonally over the eight years between major architectural redesigns. But ultimately, it took a global pandemic changing the fundamental nature of casual dining to break the architectural model that we made. And even in the face of that, IHOP and the team in place in 2020, they were able to adapt to change too, taking on some pretty bold changes to meet the needs of a tumultuous time. The second skill in the head of a sense maker is being able to reconcile mental models. When we're making sense with other people, we are dealing with a lot of information, literally. For every person that you involve in a project, imagine that there is a map in their mind of everything that they know. And the thing that you're working on together, it's on their map, but it's represented based on the way that the rest of their map is arranged, prioritized and ordered. It's based on what they care about and the things that their experience has shaped their knowledge to be. These individual maps of knowledge are called our mental models. We all have them and we can't see each other's, no matter how hard we might try. Devices like language exist so that we can compare and express our mental models of the world to one another, but we ourselves cannot see our own ever-changing mental model, even though they influence our habits, emotions, sensations, thoughts, and impulses. We're making sense with other people each of them come to that problem with their own background, experience, and knowledge, and their mental model that influences how they act, feel, and know. There is an artful skill of being able to spend time with people with the express goal to understand their mental model. And there is also a separate but equally important skill in being able to identify and understand your own mental model, and then to be able to reconcile yours with theirs. The goal being to identify when contradictions or conflicts between those mental models is in the way of safety or progress towards your intention. I think much of my success on my work on Nike came down to reconciling mental models. There were so many examples in that project where something as simple as a mismatch of language between two teams became like a sticking point that continued to rear its head until it was finally reconciled and progressed through. But the rec reconciliation of mental models isn't always about documenting the mental models and then just showing them to the people who hold or contradict them. Instead, reconciling mental models, it's like a thread that you have to weave through the whole process, taking the time to make sure that all of the mental models are accounted for as the journey takes its inevitable peaks and valleys. I chose the word reconcile because to me, it feels both final and never done in equal measure. I think if you spend time with this skill for your professional benefit, you won't be surprised when it helps personally as well. I can tell you that being able to reconcile your own mental model and the mental model of a loved one during an especially difficult time can be a true gift. The last set of skills that I want to talk about are strengthened by the hands of the sense maker, developing frameworks and driving process. Now from my Nike story, I got thinking about the impact of a process and the lack of process on a team but more specifically how actively I had to drive a process as a sense maker. Determining the list of tasks up front is easier than making it all happen. It's like this amorphous blob of tasks made of clear words that somehow lose the weight of their reality through the lightness of their labeling. Propose a research plan, host a speaker series, create a launch strategy, vaccinate the population. These all seem a bit too easy when written out on a checklist. Driving process is the skill that takes that vague check mark and turns it into momentum. Getting the plan together to move all the right people and all the right pieces to all the right places to get that thing to happen, whatever that thing is. Sometimes our process goes off road. I can tell you that that was the case many times in that Nike story. Times where I looked at that map on the wall in Portland, only four interviews into a week of 12, thinking, what have I gotten myself into? This is not make sensible. Friends, this is normal. This is the heart freaking out a little because this is the work of facilitating authentically. 
listening to 12 people go into excruciating detail about their roles in a process that was so complex that until a few weeks ago, you could never have dreamed it took this many people to get a single pair of sneakers onto feet in the street. When this little freak out of the heart happens, the skill is for me to keep driving, even though it's hard and I wanna pull over. Now, I wanna pause here to make sure that we talk about burnout. I am not advocating for you to drive hard until your body gives out heart, head, and hands. Please listen double hard to this part. Part of driving is controlling the speed and safety of the driving that we are doing. We must determine the right speed when establishing our direction with our intention. And we have to be honest about what things will take because if our speed and our intention are in conflict, we will never reach our destination. Defining the process is part of the role of a sense maker, and it's an important one. But when I talk about driving the process, coming up with humane milestones for yourself and your collaborators must be an inherent part of that work. And perhaps I should have mentioned before that taking care of ourselves, the makers, should always be part of being intentional. Because without us, who else can reach our unique intentions? One thing I see a lot of is the muddying of process and framework, where people say things like, make a customer journey map or make a product roadmap, when still in the defining the process phase, instead of focusing on the value that they are seeking from the process at that phase. Jumping to a specific framework quickly or associating certain frameworks with timeframes and processes might feel like repeatable magic, but ultimately it can be incredibly limiting, which is less repeatable magic and more just repeatable. If a team is instead asked to understand our customer's experience with our current ordering process, or to think deeply and cross-functionally about how the product might change over one, three, and five years, a very different process might be spurred. One that is more likely to actually be useful to the work versus a tried and true framework that only might be useful. That's why I wanted to separate out the sense-making skills of driving process and developing frameworks to make a little space for the consideration that they don't always and perhaps shouldn't always be so mixed up in one another. I worry that when they spend too much time overlapping, they start to create the conditions for that's the way we've always done it thinking, which I see as a main source for the dampening of curiosity and innovations for many teams and organizations. And I'm also a firm believer in this verb developing when it comes to frameworks, because I am frankly sick of seeing people recycle the frameworks of others when that time would often be much better spent developing a unique framework for the unique circumstance in which you find yourself. My sister, who's now a pastry chef, had her first baking job at a little French cafe. In addition to her baking tasks, she was in charge of making sandwiches to order during the daily lunch rush. Over time, she had become quite annoyed that the wait staff was all over the place in terms of how they wrote out customer sandwich orders on a small notepad that they kept next to the register. It almost always resulted in a verbal back and forth of clarification, which could feel really stressful in an already turbulent cafe environment during lunch. She asked me if I would help her to design a custom notepad that had all the sandwich options that the bakers wanted the wait staff to be more consistent in filling out clearly. We made a prototype and she took it to work to get the owner and staff on board with the idea. They ordered a custom notepad, and within a few weeks, the whole thing made a lot more sense. The process had not really changed all that much. The piece of paper was still on the notepad. The notepad was still at the register. The wait staff still asked customers the same list of questions about the same menu items. The piece of paper with the details was then passed to the baker to make the sandwich. What had changed was the framework that the process had used. Identifying and alleviating this problem was my sister driving the process by developing a framework. It's sense-making, as classic as it comes. I was once touring the backstage of a show at the Ashland Shakespeare Festival when I ran into this messy but perfect framework. It really cemented for me this understanding of how deep sense-making goes and how many roles it touches in this world. This framework is really simple. It's a color-coded list of costume changes. If the costume change is within a certain time range, it's highlighted in a certain color. This allowed the actors to understand the most important information first when coming off of stage, whether they're able to completely relax or whether to anticipate a whirlwind of people undressing and redressing them at a frenzied haste as if their bodies were at a pit stop. What a lovely use of a framework to save the emotional energy of a colleague by answering their most anticipated question at a critical juncture. Will people need to be touching me in haste? 
Will I be getting nude in this vestibule? I can say in 16 years of IA practice that I have never personally needed to develop a framework to answer this question for users. But I sure am glad that other people are out there developing frameworks to drive whatever process is needed to get their intention into the world. It proves the uniqueness of all of our individual contexts and reminds us that not all things are one Google away. Frameworks and process largely control what our hands are doing while sense making, but the connection to the head and the heart is not without massive importance. In making this framework, I've realized that my real lesson is on the importance of becoming more whole as a sense maker. Some of the things on this list came quite naturally to me. There's a reason that my sister knew to come with, to me with the bakery problem. I've always been a framework developer. I've always been curious about the process that things take and how many steps can be planned for and executed to get big things done over time. I suppose you might say that I was born with the hands of a sense maker. As an information architect who came up in the user experience community, I had a good basis for the conceptual underpinnings of things like change management and mental models and goal setting and facilitation, all of which still serve as the basis for my work and my expertise. But it was the realization that it actually takes more than theoretical knowledge and experience with the right tools to be whole as a practitioner in pretty much anything. We have to make sense along the way, more and more sense as we advance in our knowledge and craft. I worry that if we aren't careful, we can spend our whole careers acquiring knowledge and getting better at understanding the craft and mediums of our chosen fields, leaving the sense-making skills to whatever natural inclinations we have or whatever smattering of education we've been given. I've developed this framework of sense-making skills because I think that we all need to collectively start making a whole lot more sense at work, at home, and in our own damn selves. We can't keep trying to find places to put things when the meaning of those things is not yet clear. In my opinion, that's how we got into a lot of the messes that we're likely to leave for the next generation to solve. If all I did in writing this piece for you all today was invent a framework to see the growth potential that I still have and the areas that I am now more than ever inspired to find ways to teach to others, well, then that's enough sense made for me. It makes sense to work on yourself, head, heart, and hands, and to cultivate your sense-making skills. And if you work on being intentional, facilitating authentically, driving process, developing frameworks, reconciling mental models, and adapting to change, you will make more sense. I promise. Thank you.